Thanks. So um, bef before I get started, I just want to mention two things. Um, the first is I was cruising around the web the other day, and I found um, there are two papers I, I noticed that are based on mini courses, much like what I'm giving here. And they will, if you look at these, they will expand a little on the sort of things I'm talking about here. And also, they give lots of references to where you can find the actual proofs of things. And so, so if you want a little bit more, um, uh, but of the same nature, um, the, uh, these two. These two um, papers are both are both good places to take to look. Um, as I said, they're both expository. They're not they're not you know they're not full of proofs, but they but they're nice um, overviews of of these groups. Okay, the second thing I want to say, and I wrote this up there here because I knew I'd forget if I didn't write it up here, is um, I called this uh, uh, mini course art and groups, and now I've written art and tits groups, where there's this movement going on to change the name from art and groups to art and tits groups. And the reason is um, art and groups are, well, first of all, as I will explain in a few minutes, they grow out of Coxeter groups. They're very closely related to Coxeter groups. And really, the theory, the general theory of Coxeter groups and art and groups is really due to Jacques Tietz not to Coxeter or Arten. And yet his name doesn't appear anywhere on uh, uh, here. I mean, it's never used. And so um, there are, you know, sort of there's this sort of movement of let's start calling these Art and Tits groups. And I'm all for it. It's just that I never remember. I'm always forgetting. I've been working on Art and groups for too long, and I always forget to say Art and Tits groups. So we're talking about Art and Tits groups, but we'll call them Art and groups for short, OK? <laughs> <laughs> all right, OK, so good. Um, that's your intro. So. My goal um, in the first lecture is to tell you what art and groups are. I know many people have maybe never encountered anything except possibly a right-angled art and group. So what are they? Um, where do they come from? Why are they interesting? And then I'm going to talk about a, a, a sort of a long list of open questions regarding art and groups. All right? That's the main goal of the first lecture. The second lecture although I may fit a little bit of this into the first lecture, um, so you can do your problems. But the second lecture, I'm going to talk about um, geometric objects, geometric techniques that are being used, have been used, and are currently being used to try to answer some of these questions. So what kind of progress have we made, and how have we done it using, by the way, cat zero cube complexes. So that's why I, I was I'm very pleased that Danny Wise gave his uh, first lectures before mine. And I'm hoping you were all there, because these objects we're going to be playing with our cat zero cube complexes. So. All right, so, um, so let's start with um, what are art and groups. Well, the story really starts with Coxeter groups. So let's actually begin with what a Coxeter group is. So um, I, I find that. Um, he, many more people have run into Coxeter groups than Artin groups because they appear in so many areas of mathematics and combinatorics, representation theory, and uh, all, geometric group theory, all, all over the place. Coxeter <laughs> groups sort of show up naturally in many, many, many contexts. Okay, so a Coxeter group. Um, there's two ways we can we can um, define it. One is just in terms of a presentation. So a Coxeter group is any group of the following form. We have some finite collection of generators. Every generator um, has order 2, so si squared equals 1 for all i. And we get to specify the order of si times sj. So si times sj, we get to specify some mij equals 1, where here mij um, can be 2, 3, Etc., and it's also allowed to be infinity. Um, but when it's infinity, this, this relation is really just not there. But we'd like to have an mij for every i and j. So either it can be finite, in which case we have a relation, or it can be infinite, in which case there's no, there's no relation. Okay? All right. So um, that's, that's, that's it. That's a definition. Um, but really, uh, a more interesting way of looking at them is uh, at geometrically. So um, geometrically, Uh, yes, i different from j. Sorry. This is for all i, and this is any i not equal to j. Absolutely. OK. Um, um, geometrically, um, um, so it turns out that any Coxeter group can be realized as a reflection group. So we can realize um, 
um, W as a group, as of a discrete um, group generated by reflections. Uh, let's see, do I want to make it? No, let's just go on. Generated by reflections. <laughs> okay, so let's think about that for a moment. Um, um, uh, draw a picture here. So uh, if I have, uh, uh, um, uh, let's just draw it in R2 for a moment. Let's say I have two reflections. So um, perhaps I'm going to reflect Si over this and Sj over this. All right, so obviously Si and Sj have order two, right? Reflect, reflect, you're back where you started. So that's, that's, um, that's good. Um, and what does this say? Well, if I do a product of two reflections like this, what I get is a rotation through twice this angle. All right? Product of two reflections gives you a rotation through twice the angle. And I want this to be a discrete group. So I want that re reflection, sorry, rotation to be some integer, 2 pi over some integer. All right? So in particular, I want this to be pi over an integer. And that integer is exactly mij. So what that mij is reading is the angle between the reflection hyperplanes. Okay? All right, so that's the way to picture what's going on here. Um, how do you get mij equal to infinity? Well, um, I don't want to go into um, formal detail of exactly what I mean by reflection, but let me just say we allow for things like um, affine reflection. So our reflection might fix some affine subspace. And if it fixes some affine subspace, then inside that affine subspace, the, um, the reflection hyperplanes could be parallel. I mean, this is actually coned off to in another dimension, but it, it's fixing this affine su um, subspace. And we have Si, Sj. And in this case, if we take Si times Sj, it's a translation. And a translation has infinite order. So in this case, we would get Mij equal infinity, all right, when you have a picture like that. All right, everybody got it? OK. So, um, OK, so um, let's. We want to um, have a simple way to, to specify a Coxeter group. So we encode this information in a um, graph, let's say gamma, where um, gamma consists of the following. The vertices of gamma are exactly in one-to-one -one correspondence with the generators. All right, one vertex for each generator, labeled by the generators. OK, and the edges, well, it's actually a labeled graph. I should say a labeled graph, excuse me. Um, um, edges in gamma, well, um, there's an edge from Si to Sj precisely when Mij is finite, is not infinite. All right, and we label it Mij. So I labeled graph, meaning I'm going, to, I'm going to keep track of those mij's by labeling edges. So this is whenever mij is not infinite, is, is less than infinity. OK? If they're infinite, there's no edge. All right? OK, so, um, so usually when we want to specify a particular Coxer group, what we do is we draw the graph. We just draw the graph, and then, and then um, say that the associated Coxer group, we, we denote associated Coxer group. All right, so usually we work this way. We start with the graph, and then we associate to it a Coxer group. So this is any finite graph with label, integer labels. OK? Yeah? Yeah, question. Uh, I guess in the definition of W, it's, it implies that the MIG are symmetric, right? Oh, yeah. Ah, I didn't say that. Um, absolutely. Um, let's see. Does that follow from this definition? They're definitely symmetric. M i j, sorry, equals m j i. Maybe that's. Is that follow from the fact that it's? Anyway, definitely symmetric. So definitely symmetric. M i j equals. It. All right. Okay. Um, okay. So. All right. Okay. So that's ca that's a Coxer group. So. Um, so, oh no, let me give you an example, because we need to have a couple of pictures in our head as we go along. Um, so let's look at a couple of um, examples of gamma. Well, the easiest one, of course, is just this with, say, two generators. Let's call them S and T. And we're looking at the Coxer group with two generators and this one relation. And I guess it's, um, I think I'll leave it for you to um, 
see that this is just what's called the dihedral group of order 2n. So 2n. It's exactly, it's exactly, um, actually, maybe I will draw you this picture because we'll use it later. So um, again, I have these two reflections with, with, where this is pi over m, right? Okay, and I start reflecting around and I get some more reflection hyperplanes, all right? And if I just look at um, um, a point in one of these regions, these are called um, chambers, and look at its, look at its um, orbit, I get, an N, and I get a 2n gone, 2m gone, okay? And what I've got, what the Coxeter group is, is the symmetry group of this of this 2m gone, all right? And that's the dihedral group of order 2m, all right? So it's just the symmetry group. And by the way, this picture I drew here is something called the Coxeter cell associated to the Coxeter group. Sorry, um, I, 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 sorry I, I didn't put in the Coxeter group here. W gamma is equal to the dihedral group. Sorry, the Coxeter group is the dihedral group of order 2m, all right? Okay, so we'll come back to... Um, Coxeter cells later, but that, that's your first image of a Coxeter cell. Okay, so um, all right, let's do, um, so that one is a finite group, all right? Um, on the other hand, clearly if I just take this with no edge, where, where I have m e m i j equal to infinity, so again s and t, but this time m i j equal to infinity, in that case I get w gamma is what's often written as d infinity, and that's just the, um, is there a name for this? So now you're taking reflections like this, if you want, right? It's the infinite dihedral group, I think is what it's called, right? It's just the infinite dihedral group. So it, 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 it's an infinite group. This is a finite group. This is an infinite group. Okay, there's a really important point to, that, um, here, and let me give you one more example so you can see it, um, which is that that's not the only way a Coxeter group can be infinite. So let me, um, let's look at this one. 3, 3, 3, all right, with, say, R, S, and T as my, as my vertices, all right, what is that Coxeter group? Well, I want three reflections, R, S, and T, and any two of them have pi over 3 as their angle between them. Well, it turns out that can be realized as what's called an affine reflection group. Namely, um, in, in the plane, let me, let, me, let me draw it up here. So if in the plane, if we take, in, in, just in Euclidean space, if we take um, an equilateral triangle and look at the reflections across each one of those faces, all right, then each one of these is pi over, over 3, all right? Um, and we take a reflection in each one of the faces, then um, that turns out to give you exactly the Coxeter group you want. But let's start doing that. We start reflecting, and what happens? Well, we get another triangle, and then we get another triangle, and we get another triangle. We reflect, 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 reflect. We tile the entire plane with triangles. So the Coxeter group, in this case, is in one-to-one -one correspondence with the, tri the entire triangulation of the plane by this. By this. So it's infinite. So, um, so W gamma equals... Um, um, is W gamma, I'll just say tiles, moving this thing around by W gamma tiles the entire plane, plane hence it is, is an infinite group. Because we're going to care whether, the, we're going to care in a little while a lot whether W, whether our Coxeter group is finite or infinite. And the point I want to make here is just because there are no infinities Mij infinities doesn't mean the Coxeter group isn't infinite. It can still be infinite. Okay? All right. Any questions? I shouldn't ask that. People just <laughs> will be here all day. Um, the concept was not accurate. The symmetry group is bigger than the The entire symmetry group is bigger. I'm just looking at the group generated by those three reflections. Well, in the first example of the polygon, I see you said oh. something. Well, anyway. Oh, you may, you're probably right. So it's not the full symmetry group, but it is the dihedral group of order 2m. You're right, there are some missing symmetries. Um, okay. It's not in the middle. Yeah. yeah, right, I understand. You're right, it's not the full symmetry group. Um, it's contained in the symmetry group. It's generated by those reflections on, the, on these. Um. Okay, so um, 
I, I, I can't spend, I, I'm hoping a lot of you have seen uh, Cox of Groups because that's not the subject of this, of this talk. The subject of this talk is art and groups. So now what is an art and group? Right, so let's move on. All right, as in the case of Cox of Groups, there's two ways of defining an art and group. Uh, the first is by simply by a um, it, it is simply by a um, um, a presentation, and let me just say uh, actually before I start that for every Coxeter group there will be an art group. So let's say we already have specified the graph. So we're given a graph, and now we're going to associate to it. We already associated a Cox group. Now we want to associate an art group to it. So assuming we've already specified our graph, then a gamma is again the same generating set. Um, now we do not want generators to be order two anymore, so we drop that relation entirely and we rewrite the second relation. So the second relation I'm now going to write like this, si dot 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 alternating ij ij with mij terms, not pairs. So if mij is three, I would stop right there. Okay, mij letters, yeah? equals the same thing in the other order. All right. Now, it turns out that in the Coxer group case, that relation and that relation are identical because I could take the inverse of this and put it on the other side. Well, in the Coxer group, the inverse of SI is SI, and I just get that relation up there. So in the, if we SI equals SI inverse, this guy is the same as this guy. But I'm not, I don't have SI equal SI inverse anymore, and I have to write it this way. They're two completely different relations in, the, in, this, in this situation. All right? Okay, so um, there, there it is, and that seems you know, kind of arbitrary. Um, so what, where do these come from and why are they interesting? Well, it comes from the geometric description. So let's look at what they are geometrically. Um, I should probably push everything up here. Let's see if I can do that. There's one on the ground. What? There's one on the ground. On the ground. Oh, that? Oh, yes, thank you. This is the hardest part of giving these talks. It's figuring out how to use the boards. All right, so let's go. I should. Is that a good? Is that okay? Uh, let's just a tiny bit more. Okay, so. All right, so we now we want to give a geometric description of this group. Um, okay, so uh, let's go back to our Coxer group. We have W gamma acting as a reflection group on Rn. And the first thing we're going to do is complexify. So just tensor Rn with, with, with um, the complex numbers. So we get um, an action on Cn. This is just the obvious thing. Just take the tensor product with the complex numbers. Um, and um, and, but now notice something interesting happens. So when we were working in Rn, the reflection hyperplanes were co-dimension one real hyperplanes. Now they're co-dimension one complex hyperplanes, which is co-dimension two in real terms, yes? So what happens now, if we remove these hyperplanes, we get some fundamental group. Things can go around the hyperplane. We're removing something of co-dimension two. It's like removing a line in R3, and now we get we get stuff that, you, you know, fundamental group. So um, let's, let's um, define the following. Um, so each reflection um, R in W gamma. And by the way, these are not just the generators, but also conjugates of the generators act as reflections. So all, all the reflections I'm looking at. Each reflection R fixes a complex hyperplane which I'll call HR in CN. Um, and what we want to look at um, 
Um, so let me say um, the associated, what's called hyperplane complement, complement. Well, first I'm going to write down something that's not quite right, but almost right, um, um, is defined as follows. Um, um, that we get, um, so I'm going to do script H gamma is going to be my hyperplane complement. And it's going to be what I get from taking Cn and removing all of these reflection hyperplanes. So the union over all the reflections, take out all the, hy all the reflection hyperplanes. All right? Um, <sighs> I'm cheating, but I don't have time to explain this in detail. In the finite Coxer group case, it's exactly this. In the infinite Coxer group case, um, in order for the theorems I'm going to state to be true, you actually have to restrict to um, a big open cone in here. It's not the whole CN. It's some big open cone in here and do the same thing. Um, it, it's a technicality that's not going to play a real role in what I say, but I'm just saying this, isn't, this, is, this is exactly the picture if you have a finite Coxer group. All right? In general, you might have to restrict to an open cone. Um, so um, what do I want to say um, about this? Oh, yeah. OK, so then the point is this is just true in general. Then W gamma acts freely on um, H gamma. Because we removed, it turns out we've removed everything which has a non-trivial stabilizer when we do this. All right, everything which has a non-trivial stabilizer lives in one of these. Um, so it now acts freely on this, um, and the main um, point is that A gamma is the fundamental group of what we get when we mod out by W gamma. All right, so these spaces arise naturally in, um, in algebraic geometry and particularly in singularity theory. Um, these spaces simply come up when, when you're trying to resolve singularities and people were interested in understanding their topology. All right, and that's where the first, the original interest in, in art and groups came from, from people who were um, trying to understand these spaces that arose. Okay, so. Sorry? The out in brain group is a particular. Yeah, well, maybe that's the example I'm going to do. Just give me a second. Um, OK, so here's, so let's do the classical example. That's exactly what I want to do. So, so let's take a, a look at this to understand it better. So here's the classical example. Um, yeah, I guess I'll do it here. Um, OK, so. Let's start with a um, uh, Coxer group that everybody uh, understands. So W gamma um, is the symmetric group on N, N letters. OK, you can now I'll leave it to you to convince yourself that is a Coxer group, OK? Um, so this is the sort of classic example of a Coxer group. Um, and there's an obvious action of this by, um, uh, on CN, namely simply permute the coordinates, all right? So by co permuting coordinates, all right, and what, is, what are the reflections here? Well, the reflections are it just interchange two coordinates. That is a reflection. All right, that is a reflection. And the reflection hyperplane, the thing that's fixed when you interchange two coordinates, is, is the subspace where those two coordinates are equal to each other. OK, so let's write that down. So um, um, I need to save that board. I can use this one. Let's use this board. All right. Um, I won't erase this. OK, so uh, um, let's see. Where are we? Yeah, OK, so, um, so the reflections, actually, let's, let's put this here. The reflections are, um, let's call it RIJ. Uh, um, Sorry, tau ij equal interchange i 
and J's coordinate. Okay, and then um, and therefore the um, H I J, which H tau I J, that is to say the hyperplane fixed by um, um, Uh, yeah, where did I where did I define uh, yeah this HR so a, the the hyperplane fixed by this by this is exactly the set Z1 to Zn in Cn such that Zi equals Zj yeah that's the hyperplane all right okay so what is the hyperplane complement the hyperplane complement is the set of Z1 to Zn um, in Cn, such that Ci is not equal to Zj for all i not equal to j. Yeah? Okay. Okay, well, that is a well known space. It's called the configuration space of n points in the complex plane. So, another way of looking at this instead of um, in the complex plane. So instead of looking at this as a point in Cn, I can look at it as n points in C. And what we need is that those are distinct, n distinct points in, in C. All right? Yeah, so, it's, uh, so we want to think of these as being a collection of n points. Here's the complex plane. And I have, I need more space here. Um, well, that's OK. I have n points in here. And um, the only rule about where they are is that they, is that they can't run into each other. They have to be distinct. Yes? All right? All right. So what's its fundamental group? All right? So we claim that A gamma is, well, I'm telling you that A gamma is the fundamental group of this thing. All right. So how do I, let's figure out what the fundamental group is. Oh, sorry, mod W gamma. By the way, what does mod W gamma do? Well, it's only a question of whether we remember what order these points are in or we if we mine up by W gamma, we just don't care what order the points come in. Same set of points, we're just not going to worry about what order, yes? OK, so either order, you can have configuration space of n ordered points or n unordered points. Either one makes sense. I'm going to look at unordered points where I don't care what order. All right, OK, so now I want to take the fundamental group. So I fix some base point. In other words, I fix, I'm going to start here. That's, I declare, I'm starting here, OK? And now uh, I let uh, time go from 0 to 1. And as time goes from 0 to 1, these guys are allowed to move around, all right? But they're not allowed to run into each other. So let's watch them move around. So let's have a little movie where this is time going down here. This is. You know, time goes from 0 to 1. And these guys move around, and they have to end up back where they started, at least up to permutation. We don't care if they get permuted. But they have to end up in the same, uh, same set of points, yeah? OK, so let's watch them. Maybe this guy goes like this. And maybe this guy, oh dear, he can't run into this, so let's be careful. He better not run into this. And maybe this guy goes like this. And this guy, oh dear. Um, goes like this. Yeah, something, right? I mean, I'm watching these move around. At any time, what I'm seeing is n distinct points in, 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 in the plane, all right? What is this group? The braid group, yes. So we all know this group. This is the braid group on n strands. So this is the classic example, and it is the one that Artin first First, this is the art and braid group, OK? All right, so um, hopefully you um, see where these came from and why people were interested in them, all right? Um, OK, so that's sort of your intro to um, um, the basic idea of an art and group, right? Yeah? You have two different definitions for the art and group. Is it supposed to be obvious, or is it an interesting result that's uh, equivalent? Um, it's not supposed to be obvious. This is, uh, this is a theorem. Yeah, this is definitely a theorem. Um, yeah, there are a lot of theorems in here I'm going to quote, not, not prove. That's right. That's right. You definitely have something you need to prove here. I mean, in this particular case, um, you, it's not hard to check that, that, the, that this thing is the brain, you know, that this thing has the, the expected um, 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 presentation that looks like this. All right? 
Um, but you're, yes, in general, there's some, definitely something to prove. All right, so um, let's move on. All right, so art and groups, um, I like to say, come in two flavors. We classify them into two groups. So art and groups, um, I'll just say come in two flavors. You're allowed to use slang for her. Anyway, they're two, they're two classified into two um, um, different groups. Um, the first one are called um, finite, uh, I like to call them finite type art and groups. Some people call them um, spherical type. Either finite or spherical type. I tend to call them finite type art and groups. And what are they? Those are exactly the ones where the Coxeter group is finite. So any art and group, a ga a any um, A gamma associated to a finite Coxeter group is called a finite type art and group. All right? On the other hand, we have infinite type, type A gamma, are those associated to infinite. Warning, the, co the art and group itself is never, never, never finite. The art and group is always infinite. In fact, the, the, um, the generators have infinite order. All right, so I'm not saying the art and group's finite. I'm saying it is an art and group associated to a finite Coxer group, OK? All right, OK. So, um, so if you've ever read a, um, if you've ever studied Coxer groups, I think I first learned about the details of Coxer groups out of Ken Brown's book on Coxer. I don't know if any of you know it. Anyway, um, as in, uh, 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 there are all kinds of books out there. He starts out with all about finite Coxer groups, develops the whole theory of finite Coxer groups. And then later in the book, he expands that to, uh, uh, to give the general theory of infinite Coxer groups. But the bottom line is, wow, everything that worked for finite Coxer groups works for infinite Coxer groups too. I mean, that's not, I'm exaggerating slightly, but I mean, essentially the theory, all the basic theory and the tools you need go through equally well for the finite and the infinite. All right, it's exactly the opposite for art and groups. We have these amazing tools that we can use to study these, and we understand an enormous amount about them. And we're totally in the dark when it comes to these, with the exception of some very special ones, like right-angled ones. There are a few special cases where, we, under, where we, have, we have other tools to work with. But essentially, these are, um, 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 so let me say a little bit about why. Um, so, uh, we know a great deal about finite type A gamma and very little about infinite type. Okay, so, so why? Um, well, the reason is, uh, I'm saving this board for something that I don't want to erase later, so let's leave it and go back to this. That's okay. I might need them both. It's possible. All right. So, um, So I don't dance when I. <laughs> okay. All right. So, um, yeah. Um, okay. So I claim we know a lot about finite type and very little about infinite type, and the question is why. And the reason is. Um, that finite type a gamma have something called a Garside structure. And that's another entire course to tell you um, about what Garside structures are. Let me just say it's an extremely nice normal form 
for words in the, for, for um, elements of the group. Extremely nice way of writing an element in terms of the generators that um, allows you to, for example, it gives, it gives you a lot of combinatorial information. For example, it gives you a bioautomatic structure, if you know what those are, and gives you just really uh, a handle on certainly anything algebraic, and it turns out a, a fair amount of geometric stuff as well. So, um, so which gives, well, not so much geometric, but certainly um, algebraic, which gives um, nice normal forms. Um, and lots of combinatorial stuff like bioautomatic structure, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And this has really been behind almost everything we know about those groups. All right? The infinite type has nothing of that sort. And that's the problem. We don't have a place to start. We don't have anything. Um, so, um, so infinite type, infinite type. A gamma. Um, well, there have been John McCammon has sort of generalized Garside structures a little bit to some affine ones, but basically, no, we don't have anything like that. So, no such tool as a Garside structure. Um, however, the most effective techniques we've had so far for studying these are geometric techniques. So actions, building I interesting, useful complexes that these things act on and using those to tell us something about the group. And that's what my second lecture is going to be about. Um, well, a little bit. We'll, hopefully, we'll get to some of it in this first lecture. But most of the second lecture is going to be about some of those constructions and how we use them to learn, to learn about these groups, all right? Because um, that's kind of what I'm interested in. OK, so uh, before we get to that, though, um, I want to tell you about um, what do we know and not know about, about these groups? Um, and I'm going to break this up into, um, um, so um, I'm going to put it over there. So here, so next I'm going to put here are some um, conjectures slash questions. And, um, most of them are about infinite type, but a few of them will be about finite type. So I don't want to specify in advance yet all right, about what I'm going to talk about. So I'm going to give you a long list of open questions. And I'm going to put them here because I want to be able to refer back to them from time to time. Okay? So we're going to save them on this, on this board over here. All right? So the first is a set of what I'm going to call old conjectures. Um, these go back. To, um, so these groups were first really studied extensively by um, Deline and Briescorn and Saito back in the 70s. So these conjectures go at least that far back. I think some of them go even farther back than that. But they go back 50 years. Okay? So these have been conjectures that have been around for a long time. Um, and um, I'm going to put a star by them so I can refer to, to back to these conjectures, these old conjectures. Yeah, 50 years is old for you guys, right? <laughs> um, OK, so here's, here's, here's some um, conjectures. OK, you're not going to, um, if you're a geometric group theorist, you're not going to believe this. We do not know if these groups have solvable word problem. We think they do. So it turns out, I'll give you a preview of what's coming. Um, it turns out these conjectures are all known for finite type. All right, but they're not known for infinite type. Okay, so so I will say afterwards which ones are known. So solvable word problem. I don't just mean that we don't have a nice solution like a bi like some nice bi-automatic structure. We don't even know if it's solvable. We don't even know if there is an algorithm to solve the word problem. All right, okay, that's crazy. All right, two, um, a gamma is torsion free. We can't find any torsion, but we neither can we prove that they're all torsion free. All right, three. Um, um, here I have to assume uh, a gamma is irreducible. So if a gamma is irreducible, and what I mean by that is that it can't that that um, I can't write it as a product of two smaller art groups. 
All right, so assume I can't split it up as a direct product of two smaller Artin groups, um, then, um, um, then we know something, we conjecture that the center of A gamma, well, we know in the finite type case that it's, it's cyclic, that there is something in the center um, if A gamma is finite. By the way, in the, uh, for example, in the, um, is finite type, excuse me. Um, in the braid group case, um, if you take the braid that does a whole 360 degree twist of the whole thing, you can check that that's in the center, that that commutes with everything. All right, you can exercise, draw a picture. Um, so they do have a center, if they have a cyclic center, if they're um, finite type, we know that. And we think the center's trivial um, if A gamma is infinite type. All right, um, four. Um, okay, we, we think, and these should really go in the opposite order, but I, I'm going to do them in this order. We think that A gamma has a finite k pi 1 space. So everybody knows what a k pi 1 space is. It's a, it's, it's a space whose fundamental group is your group, A gamma, and the universal cover is contractible. There's no, other, there's no other homotopy. The universal cover is contractible. So these are extremely useful uh, k pi 1 spaces in homotopy theory and computing cohomology groups and all kinds of, in all, you know, they're, they're basically the topological way to work with, to, to work with a group. Um, so n in fact, we not only, um, um, think that there is one, but we think we know what it is, and I will explain this later. Let me just say, namely, the Salvetti complex. So by the way, finite, I mean finite CW complex, sorry. By finite, I mean there's a finite CW complex, which is a k pi 1 space um, complex for a gamma. Now you heard, if you were in Danny's talks this morning, what the Salvetti complex was for a right-angled Artin group. Turns out there's a Salvetti complex for every Artin group, which I will explain to you later what it is. Okay, so, um, and we think that is in fact a k pi 1 space, always, for every. And the last one, 5, is, um, All right, the last one goes back to this um, description of um, this hyperplane complement. So I already said that the reason we were interested, the, re the interest in A gamma came originally from the fact that it shows up as, fun as the fundamental group of um, this hyperplane complement, right? I, I, I said that, right? OK, well, the conjecture is that this guy is a k pi 1 space. Now, it's not a CW complex, but in the sense that it has the right fundamental group and its universal covering space is contractible. So it already carries all the topological information one would want to study this group. So this last one is um, the H uh, gamma ma w gamma is, uh, is a k pi 1 space. Um, maybe I should say a Ka gamma 1 space. Would that be better? It's a K pi 1 space for A gamma. How's that? Ka gamma 1 space may be a better way of saying it. It's a Ka gamma 1 space. Um, um, and by the way, um, since we already know it has the right fundamental group, all we need to prove is that its universal covering space this is the universal covering space, is contractible. That's what's left to prove, because we know it has the right fundamental group. All right? OK, this one, um, you may not find the most interesting, but it's the most famous. And it has a name. It's called the k pi 1 conjecture. So if you. Um, So for example, in that um, I put up those papers, there was one that uh, Lewis Paris paper that was about the k pi 1 conjecture. That's the conjecture he's talking about, all right? So this is the most famous conjecture uh, um, regarding these things, okay? 
OK, so as geometric group theorists, we'll probably find the first few more interesting. But the, but the people who are interested in these, for other reasons, were particularly interested in these, in, in these um, later ones. OK, so um, there, that, that's the list of, um, yeah, so let me say what we know. So as I said, in the um, early 70s, um, Deline and a paper by Briescorn and Saito. Two, these are two separate papers. They appear in the same journal, though, I think, um, or it's around the same time. Early 70s, Deline and Briescorn and Saito proved that um, all of these conjectures hold for finite type. OK, and since then, and this is part of what I'll talk about in my next talk, we've proved that they hold for certain classes of infinite type. But they're all still open for an arbitrary infinite type. None of them is known in complete, uh, completely. All right, We've almost solved the, the, the trivial center one, almost. Anyway, I'll talk about this in the second, in the second uh, talk, OK? All right, so, um, all right, so these conjectures have been around for ages. And we're sort of just now beginning to you know, figure out ways of dealing with them. Um, OK, there's another set of conjectures, which I'm also going to put up here. And then, good, then I'll still have 10 minutes left to tell you about the lean complexes. Um, that is newer. And I'm not going to say, I don't need to save, so they can go on this board. Um, and these have to do with, um, you know, I, I'm, I'm a geometric group theorist, so I like to know is a, is a group hyperbolic? Is it cat zero? Is it, you know, those kind of questions that we ask, right? So, so what that means is that does it, so we're asking, does the group act properly co-compactly on some really nice space, a, a hyperbolic metric space, or a cat zero metric space, or a cubicle cat zero, even better metric space? So we want to know geometric properties, all right? So let me list some new questions. And these are all questions, because we don't have answers to any of them, really. Um, all right, so one, um, is a gamma hyperbolic? Well, we know the answer to that one, <laughs> turns out. Um, and the answer is um, um, yes, if and only if. Uh, th this, is an, this is one of the exercises on your exercise sheet, is to prove that the answer is yes, if and only if a gamma is the free group, meaning if and only if gamma is, dis is a discrete, has no edges, has no edges. If it has no edges, then, then the Artin group is a, is a free group, and so they are clearly that's hyperbolic, OK? That's the only case, all right? So that's an exercise, OK? So we know the answer to that one, actually, all right? So we could then ask, is, is a gamma cat 0, meaning does it act properly co compactly on a cat 0 space? Or better still, is it cubically cat 0? Can we make it act on a cat 0 cubical complex? Um, cubically cat 0? What do you call these? Something that acts on a cubical cat zero. Cubulated? Co compactly cubulated. Co cubulated. I mean, just write it like this. Whatever. So acts nicely on a cat zero space or nicely on a cat zero, um, a cubical cat zero space, one that comes from cube complex, all right? Um, um, we don't know, all right? So even for braid groups, we only know, so it's, it's conjectured that braid groups are cat zero, but it's only known for braid groups of, uh, 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 on at most n strands, uh, six strands, on at most six strands. All right, it's known to be true for up to six strands. Past that, we don't know. And in fact, this, there are some really interesting recent papers um, showing that, nope, most of them aren't, most of the braid groups even. Anything braid group of more than, n, more than four strands is not cubically cat zero. So the question here is, who knows? Don't know. We, we don't know even for, even for braid groups. And the question here is often not. Many, many cases, um, the answer is no. They're not co-compactly cubulated, but it's not oh. known whether or not they're cubulated. When I, OK, I, all right. So I don't know that. To, when I say cat zero, I mean acts properly co-compactly. All right? And I want the same thing here acts properly co-compactly on a, usually when you say things cat zero. So um, fine, I'll put in co-compactly. I want proper co-compact actions, OK? 
uh, uh, for these two questions. All right, there's a bunch of names here. Um, um, should I try and write them all up or just say them? Um, um, let me see. I can't even pronounce them. Haytel is the H-A-E-T-T-E-L. Haytel? Did I pronounce that one right? Um, he's got a bunch of results. He's got results on both of them. And then you can help me with this one, Danny. Um, there's a paper by Wang, um, Yankiewicz, and Piotr. But tell me how to pronounce Piotr's last Dyslexic. name. You know, I don't know how to pronounce Okay. Pritsky. I'm sorry. Pritsky. Pritsky. Oh, okay, whatever. I'm very bad at it. I can, I can write it up here for you. Anyway, there are a bunch of recent papers showing that, in fact, even the braid groups, most of the braid groups and a lot of other uh, art groups cannot be cumulated. That's really bad news. And let me tell you why it's bad news. We don't know how to construct cat zero spaces that aren't cubicle, or we don't have much, you know, we really, constructing cat zero spaces out of something other than cubes is really hard. So if they're not cubicle, we're going to have a hard time answering this one because we're going to have to find weird cat zero spaces that don't come from cube complexes and you know so that's a hard problem all right so okay so um, let's keep going um, so um, let's see what else did I have two more three um, um, oh questions about okay these are um, if, if you're not into this stuff don't worry about it there are weak versions of hyperbolic like acylindrically hyperbolic I think somebody mentioned that in an earlier talk so um, is a gamma uh, I'm, I'm gonna leave space here for a reason acylindrically So that means a, there's an action on a, a hyperbolic metric space that isn't as nice as you'd like. It's not proper, but it has some nice um, conditions, all right? So it's a weaker version of this. So it turns out if it has a center, it can't possibly be. So we first have to bot out by the center to have any hope here of getting anything. So if it's finite type, it has a center. We have to kill that to even hope that it might work, all right? Um, um, we we um, um, more or less have an answer to this one, all right? This one appears to be yes, all right? So it was first done for, um, it was done for the finite type by um, Calvez and, and Wiest, and then Indira, Chatterjee, and Martin, is that how you pronounce it? Okay. Um, did it for the something called FC type, which we'll talk about later, and then Rose, Morris, Wright, and I have almost finished the picture, but there's still some technicalities, uh, a few cases where we can't, we can't deal with yet. But the answer looks like it's going to be yes, and we've almost answered this one. So hopefully yes on all of those, all right? Um, OK, and the last one is, um, um, oh, I don't even want to say what these are. Wait, nobody's mentioned hierarchically hyperbolic here. OK, we won't worry about it. So there's something called hierarchically hyperbolic group, um, which I absolutely won't define. But what it's really about is trying to construct an analog of the curve complex for these things. So the braid group can be viewed as a mapping class group instead of as an Artin group. And it has a curve complex. And curve complexes are really useful. So the question is, is there something like a curve complex for other Artin groups, at least for the finite type? And that's an interesting question. Is there an analog of the curve complex? or a gamma. And um, so there's some work on this by oh, a paper with tons of authors, Completo, Gebhardt, Wiest, and thank you, Gonzalez Manessis, yes. And then another one recently by Rose Morris Wright. Who's, anyway, there's some work being done on this, but we're far from a real answer to it. OK, so I don't, I'm not going to go into these. These are beyond the, the scope of this talk. I simply want to say that um, there's several, a lot of interesting things to think about. Some of them are very basic and combinatorial and are old, have been around forever. And then there's all these new questions involving what the geometry of these things look like. So I think they're interesting groups to study. Ah, eh, I have only five minutes. OK, so that actually brings us to the second part of the talk. But I wanted to give you a little bit of it because the exercises are between the two talks. So if you look at the exercises, the front page are some mostly fairly easy 
um, questions about basic questions about playing with some art and groups. And the second part is playing around with one of the cat zero cube complexes we're going to use in the second half of the talk. So what I'm going to do now is define it, and then in the second half of the talk we will use it and see what it's good for. Okay? So as I said, the um, um, so this is um, really sort of part two. It's the geometric techniques that we've used to. Um, Um, <clears throat> study art and groups. But before we do that, I need a little bit of terminology. Um, so, so, back to, so back to basic, quest, ba basic theory of art and groups. So um, first of all, some terminology. Um, which is, or notation if you want. Um, OK, so suppose um, A gamma. Um, um, is, an, is an art group. I just want to give a name to the um, generating set. I'm going to refer to the generating set um, at, as S. So of course it's equal to the vertex set of gamma, but I just want to be able to call it S. All right, it's S1 to Sn, whatever. Um, okay, so that's the generating set. Then for any T contained in or equal to S, and that includes the empty set, is allowed here. Any subset of um, S, um, we define, we, we, this is just notation, we let AT be equal to the subgroup of um, A gamma generated by T. Okay? All right. Well, T is a bunch of vertices inside this graph gamma. And we could also look at the subgraph spanned by T. In other words, connect them with edges if and only if they were connected in, in gamma with edge and edge. So, um, so uh, the question is, how are these related? And the answer is, it's what you think it is. So um, 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 fact, and this is due to um, van der Leck. Uh, I forget when, 80s or 90s, somewhere like that. Um, he showed that if del t is the um, subgraph of gamma spanned by t, then in fact, in the obvious way, a t is naturally isomorphic in the obvious way to A del T. It is, in fact, the Artin group given by that graph. Yeah, that's not surprising. That was well, well known for Coxer groups. That, that, um, that's true. So I, uh, if I restrict to any subgraph, I have some complicated graph gamma. And if I restrict to some subgraph in it, then the, the, then the subgroup generated by those generators is the Artin group for that subgraph. That's all I'm saying. All right. OK, so all right, so um, oh, these are called, these are known as as I'll, I'll, I'll usually just write it like this. Uh, they're known as special subgroups. And more generally, um, they're conjugates. So if I conjugate one of them, say G A T G inverse are called parabolic subgroups. Okay, so I want to just want to be able to use this notation. All right. Um, okay, so let me define for you. I'm going to go about two or three minutes over. We're just about there. I just need to give you the definition of this. OK, so um, all right, so, um, so back in the 1990s, um, uh, Mike Davis and I, uh, we were trying to prove the k pi 1 conjecture. All right, so what did we want to prove? We wanted to prove that this space, this universal covering space, was contractible. So what we did is we constructed a cube complex with the same homotopy type as this. All right, we showed we could retract this thing onto a certain cube complex. So um, 
Um, so let's see. Um, so we defined a cube complex, which I'll denote d gamma because we referred to it as the Deline complex. And the reason is that Deline had used something kind of like this in his, in his work back, back then. Um, we define the Deline complex, um, um, a cube complex such that, and this part I won't explain how we did it. This is a whole nother. It's homotopy equivalent to this. We basically retracted this space onto some cube complex. Right? So we found this cube complex we could, we could put inside it. All right, so now proving this is contractible is a matter of proving a cube complex is contractible. All right? Well, how, oh, by the way, we already know it's simply connected because it's homotopy equivalent to this guy, which is a universal cover. It's simply connected. Um, so I've got a simply connected cat zero. Um, I mean, I have a simply connected cube complex, and I want to prove it's contractible. And the answer is just prove it's cat zero, because every cat zero space is contractible. OK, so there was an obvious sort of next step. So, um, um, so I claim, so suffices to prove d gamma is cat 0. And if you remember, I'll go back over this at the beginning of the next talk. But if you remember from Danny's talk, to prove it's cat 0, we need um, that it's non-positively curved and simply connected. We already have simply connected, so all we need is non-positively curved. And we have great techniques for checking whether a cube complex is non-positively curved. So I will. Uh, that is part of that um, is on your exercises. Um, and I will simply define the complex and then let you go. Um, I would say the first, as I said, the first part of the uh, first front of the exercise sheet is just simple things on art and groups. The second part is all about this complex. All right. So what is this complex? So let me define it for you. Um, D gamma um, is the following. So I'll start with the vertices. Um, the vertices are are one, in one to one correspondence with cosets where A is any element in A gamma. And the important thing is that AT is finite type. So T is contained in S, and AT is finite type. OK, notice, by the way, this is only interesting when the, when the, the full A gamma is infinite type. Otherwise, it's not, not really interesting. But, so let's assume that A, the full A gamma is infinite type. So we've got an infinite type thing. But inside, there can be plenty of subgraphs that generate finite type. For example, any single edge generates a finite type. All right? So it can have lots of subgraphs that generate finite type things. Just because the whole thing is infinite type doesn't matter. All right? So we get. Um, 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 those are the vertices. Edges um, is just when one thing, one, co one co such coset is contained in another with, by, and differ by a single. So if I can add a single generator to T and still get something finite type, then I connect those two. So they have to have, a same, uh, uh, they have, to have a common representative, and they have to differ by a single generator. Right, differ by a single generator. OK, and finally, what are cubes? Well, cubes um, are a generalization of this. They're what I call intervals. Namely, let's write A, A, T. So now let's say I differ by more than one generator. So, R, um, so where A, A, T is contained in A, A, R. And what is this cube? So what do I mean by this? Well, I'm going to look at everything that's between here and here. And I claim I'm going to see a cube. Because if I start out with a, a little a, a, t, I can add one, I can add one guy that's in here and was, was not in, you know, I can add one guy, t union s1, and then maybe I add another guy, and then maybe I add both, and then maybe I add a third guy. So what happens here? Eventually, I'm going to end up at AAR. Here I've added one, an S, I, and maybe then I add another one, union S, I, S, J. And eventually, I've added enough to get me all the way to here. All right? And if you look at all the different ways of adding this one first versus that one versus that one, what you see is the one skeleton of a cube. All right? 
So if I look at all the things that live between here and here, I see a cube. I fill in that cube. Fill it in. All right? Put a cube in there. OK? So that's where my cubes are. Um, I'm, I'm out of time, so I, I'm, I'm going to leave it at that. Um, there, there is a, a, another way to describe this as a simplicial complex, where you just think of this as a partially ordered set and take the geometric realization. Um, the problem is that um, that description isn't going to help us. We really need the cubicle description to do anything with this. So the question is going to be, is this or when is this cat zero? And that's sort of part of that. The beginning of that question is on your, is on your, um, on your exercise sheet. All right, so this is going to play a central role in the second half. I'm going to quit here and um, have fun. <laughs>